Hello, this is uh, lecture one of week seven, Botany and Plant Sciences 031, Spring Wildflowers, corresponding to Monday, May the 11th. Uh, this week, we're going to see two families, the Fabaceae, the pea family, uh, which we're going to see on Monday and Wednesday. It's a large family. It's very important. And then on Friday, we're going to see a very interesting family, at least for me, I really love the plants in those family, the cactaceae, the cactus family. So uh, basically, let me start. Uh, today's going to be a short lecture because in, in the live lecture, in the synchronous lecture, we've discussed the final exercise, and so we didn't get a lot of time for the lecture. Let me share a screen and at least give you an introduction to the Fabaceae for Monday this week for lecture one, week seven. So the Fabaceae, the, the pea family, is a very large heterogeneous family. He has in the order of uh, 13,000 species in containing more than 600 genera. Um, there are plants in the Fabaceae in cold environments in the north. There are plants in the, or in the south, in, in um, the extreme south, like Patagonia, New Zealand, or in the extreme north, like Canada or uh, Scandinavia. Uh, but there are also a number of plants that are tropical, some large tropical trees, belong in the Fabaceae and some important tropical crops also belong in the Fabaceae. Uh, so you will have in the family from very small plants like for example uh, the prairie clover that is uh, a stoloniferous plant, a plant with stolons that grows at ground level uh, to really some large trees, uh, tropical trees like for example the tamarind tree that can be a very large um, tree that grows in the tropics and that produces edible fruit. Uh, perhaps the most important traits of the Fabaceae one is almost unfailingly all plants in the family have compound leaves with um, uh, stipules. Um, it's, uh, compound leaves is a common trait in, in the family. And perhaps the most distinctive uh, trait in the family is the fruit. Uh, as a matter of fact, until not too long ago, the family Fabaceae was known as the leguminosae, the legumes. We still know it in common English as the legumes because the fruit is a legume. It's one carpal that is turned around on itself and all the ovules are attached to the suture line. So the placentation is marginal. You can also consider it parietal because in one carpal, marginal and parietal placentation is the same. The ovules are, the placentas are attached to the suture line of a carpal enclosed within itself. Uh, it has a lot of really important uh, plants. The soybean, for example, food plants in terms of feeding humanity. The soybean is uh, in the Fabaceae. All the New World beans, like the common beans, the um, kidney beans, uh, the lima beans, all the beans that come from the Americas, all the way from the Andes to Central America and Mexico to Mesoamerica, they all belong in this family. From Africa, uh, we have uh, the cow peas, also known as black-eyed peas, uh, Vigna ungiculata belongs in this family. From the Mediterranean, the sweet peas, the thyrus, and from the Middle East, uh, the lentils and the chickpeas. Uh, also from the Middle East and the Mediterranean, the fava beans, which are really big and nice to eat. And for, from the New World, the peanuts. Uh, so it's really in terms of feeding humanity, it's an incredibly important family. And uh, one of the traits that makes it important is these little 
blobs that all legumes have in the roots. These are, uh, the technical word is bacterial nodules. The family leguminosae, the family Fabaceae, they, they have an association with a genus of bacteria uh, and a family also of bacteria known as rhizobium. Um, so rhizobia in plural are bacteria that grow in the roots of uh, the legumes. Rhizo meaning in Latin roots and uh, the ending bio or bia or bium meaning uh, live. So there are organisms attached to the roots. Uh, the first uh, researcher to discover the property of rhizobia was uh, Martinus Bejerink, a Dutch microbiologist, <coughs> who realized that what the rhizobia are doing, these nodules, this is not a disease. These are bacteria that actually harvest atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into amino acids. So it's a fantastic symbiosis. Uh, the plants will do photosynthesis and capture solar energy in terms of, of the sunlight that is captured and, and they will produce um, um, carbohydrates as a result of that, they will produce sugars. And some of those sugars are translocated down the, from the leaves to the root to feed the bacteria. And the bacteria basically provide the plant, pay for the service by providing the plant with nitrogen that they harvest from the air. Uh, nowadays, of course, we can harvest nitrogen from the air uh, by a process known as Haber's synthesis, which is an industrial process. Uh, but it's very, very expensive in terms of energy. A large chunk of the CO2 emissions that are contributing to climate change and to the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is uh, emissions made to produce the energy to uh, convert atmospheric nitrogen into fertilizer. The <clears throat> legumes do that for free. They, they, with the energy that they can produce with photosynthesis. Until a century ago, rotating crops with legumes was uh, the most powerful way farmers had to maintain soil fertility and to maintain the yields of their, of their crops. Because these plants produce, uh, capture nitrogen and can produce their own amino acids, uh, they are incredibly rich in proteins. So many of, uh, of the legumes actually play a huge role as complementary crops to uh, cereals. In almost all civilizations, as we will see, uh, in almost all agricultural civilizations, the farming of a cereal like rice or wheat or maize or barley or oats has always been associated with the farming of a legume, some sort of beans or peas uh, that were used to provide protein to those uh, societies. Legumes as crops evolved in association with the cultivation of grasses, of cereals. Um, the cereals will produce the bulk of the energy we consume and the legumes will give a qualitative aspect to our diet in terms of a nutrient and especially protein rich uh, diet. Uh, some legumes are very specific, for example, and don't look at a first glance, like a legume at all. For example, the, the peanuts, as the name even in English suggests, nuts, the legume becomes lignified. You can see this is the legume of the peanut. It becomes lignified to support inside uh, two, sometimes three, four or more uh, seeds that are nutty and dry. So actually they operate pretty much like a nut and they have the same seed disperser that acorns or walnuts or pecan nuts have, organisms that consume seed and disperse the nuts. And uh, like in a nut, the pericarp becomes lignified, sort of woody, uh, and uh, it supports the nuts inside. Uh, in other legumes, uh, like this species here, the tamarind, um, tamarinds uh, are from Asia. They were 
uh, brought to the Americas during the early uh, Spanish colony by the Jesuit priests that organized uh, trade between the Philippines first and then India and China with the Americas. And one of the first plants they brought was tamarind that took off like wildfire, wildfire in, in, in the Americas. Uh, everybody started cultivating it because it's so nice to eat. Tamarind is a legume also, it belongs in the family, but the external part, the exocarp, is uh, woody, a little bit like uh, peanut, somewhat corky more than woody, I would call it. But then the mesocarp is fleshy. It develops a very fleshy mesocarp. And so it's a legume, the fruit is definitely a legume, but it also has some of the traits of a droop. It has a fleshy mesocarp uh, that is rich in carbohydrates, very sweet and nice to eat. Uh, and then one of the examples of the adaptation of uh, the fruit of the legumes of a legume that doesn't look like a legume at all, it takes a while to figure it out, is the fruit of the tipuana, the tipuana fruit. The tipuanas are from the great Chaco in South America, from Paraguay, Brazil, uh, Argentina. And they're basically the, the legume ovary. Uh, once it becomes fertilized, it develops only one seed. It's a one seeded ovary. And the rest of the structure of a legume, the carpal folded on itself, becomes perfectly flat. And it folds along the suture line. So you can imagine, it looks pretty much like a folded leaf, doesn't it? Uh, this is the central vein of the leaf. This is the suture line of the fold. And these are the lateral veins of the bract of the, of the leaf. And all this acts like uh, a helicopter blade. They are, they are wind, wind dispersed. They are samaras in terms of the nomenclature for the fruit. Wind dispersed fruit, you might recall is known as a Samara. So legumes can take many different forms uh, from fleshy fruits to winged fruits to dry nut fruits. But if you look at the structure, they're always the same. They're one single carpal folded on itself with uh, marginal placentation. Another interesting trait in, uh, in the legume family uh, very common to many plants in the family is the fact that they're rich in uh, pectin in the cell walls and they have uh, an enzyme called pectase in the um, vacuoles inside the cell. So if a cell wall gets damaged by a herbivore, for example, uh, or by an insect attacking the plant, uh, when the cell breaks, um, the content of the vacuum will get in contact with the cell wall and it will, uh, the pectase will hydrolyze the pectin in the cell wall and make a mucilage, uh, which is basically hydrolyzed pectin. Like pectin is the same thing we put in, in jams and marmalades to make them thick. So the mucilage will be bled uh, from the wound of the plant and it will act a little bit like an immune system, like a reactive system. If an insect is trying to penetrate the plant, it will uh, uh, sort of um, surround the insect with uh, thick mucilage and, and repel it. Uh, mucilage in, in legumes has been used for many years. You can see here in this one, gum, gum arabic uh, from Acacia Senegal and African Acacia. Uh, when, when it's damaged, it bleeds. Uh, um, a mucilage here, it bleeds um, uh, pectin. And uh, that gum was used by, uh, all, has been used in history for all sorts of things, among them by um, Renaissance painters who used to use gum to make their paint and their pigments thick in order to apply them into canvas or into walls when they were painting frescoes. There is one in particular, Astragalus tragacanthus, uh, common throughout the Mediterranean, also in Africa and in the Middle East, uh, that also yields uh, large amounts of gums. If you cut the, the stems, it will bleed gums and then dry, like, like here. Um, and that was, has always been used as a hair fixer. You, you dissolve the gum in water and it makes a mucilage, a sticky substance that you can put in your hair and it will fix your hair. Even 
to these days, there is uh, some concoctions. There's one that the name is so funny um, in Spanish. You, you see it in, in CVS and in many uh, pharmacies in the United States. It's called moco de gorilla, gorilla snot. Uh, and it's basically gum tragacanth, emulsified gum tragacanth to put in your hair and make it firm. But the most important uh, product of a legume family for human beings is beans. There's a huge variety of beans, navy beans, kidney beans, lima beans, um, chickpeas, uh, mung beans, um, all sorts of, of different beans that evolved in different parts of the world. Uh, some beans, let me, for some reason, okay. Uh, uh, some beans were evolved in Asia where rice was domesticated. So the domestication of rice had as an associate domestication, the domestication of cultivated beans, in particular in Asia, soybeans uh, that were uh, used to complement uh, the agriculture of rice. In the Middle East, a number of beans were also domesticated together with the uh, domestication of wheat, oat, and barley, among other crops. In uh, uh, equatorial and sub-Saharan Africa, uh, chickpeas and black-eyed peas were domesticated together with sorghum and millet that became uh, the main crops in this part of the world. In South America, uh, in the Andes, uh, lima beans uh, were domesticated together with uh, uh, wheat and potatoes. And of course, in North America, and what is now, or Mesoamerica, what is now Mexico and Central America, all the way to the southern part of the United States, the native people domesticated um, the um, kidney beans, the black beans, and in, in the United States, the uh, native tribes in New Mexico and Arizona domesticated the tepary beans, which are really nice to eat. So you can see them here, soybeans in Asia, and mung beans in Asia, um, green peas, uh, lentils of different colors and forms, fava beans, uh, chickpeas in the Middle East. The Middle East was a cradle of, of domesticated beans. Uh, Black-eyed peas and chickpea and, uh, sorry, cow peas in Africa. Lima beans in the Andes and the black beans and the kidney beans in uh, Mesoamerica. Everywhere there was a, an agricultural civilization developing, uh, the beginning of uh, human settlements and large civilizations, there was some form of cultivated cereal that provided carbohydrate together with some domesticated form of beans that uh, provided uh, protein. It's interesting, uh, you have uh, a section in the lecture notes on bean lectins and human digestion. There is practically in every society, there is the idea that uh, beans give you a bad digestion and will give you flatulence, will make you uh, have farts or will make you fart. Really what makes that is a substance called lectins in, uh, in uh, beans. And a particular form, lectins are, are proteins, uh, enzymes uh, that are toxic, not so much to human beings, partially they are, but also to the um, um, microbiome, to the microorganism in our, in our gut. And the reason why beans produce lectins is because of this insect here, which is the bean weevil uh, in the family uh, Brookidae, uh, also known as brooked beetles. Brooked beetles love eating beans because we can relate to what we discussed at the beginning. Uh, beans are rich in protein because they, fertilize, they, they, they harvest nitrogen, they fix atmospheric nitrogen, so they have lots of protein and they can make a lot of uh, protein substances, uh, enzymes and even structural proteins. So insects love to eat 
the bean seed because it's so rich in protein, much richer than, for example, the seed of, of grasses or other plants. It's really rich in protein and, 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 and very hearty to eat. And in order to defend itself from, the, from insect eaters, uh, the beans have produced a substance called lectins. And within lectins, a particular substance, which are agglutinins, which actually tend to uh, clot the blood of the animals that eat it, or in the case of insects, the lymph. The insects don't have proper blood, but they do have a similar substance, uh, which is the insect lymph. So insects eating the beans will tend to get intoxicated. And there's been an arms race relationship because uh, as the beans become toxic, the insects have developed the ability to detoxify the beans and keep on eating them. Uh, so there is this, this uh, relationship in which beans throughout their evolutionary history have been producing more and more agglutinins in order to defend themselves. This is uh, the, the legume lectin, which is a phyto, phytohemoagglutinin, uh, which is a substance that actually will tend to uh, clot your blood. And, and uh, eventually, if you eat a lot, it might uh, kill you. As a matter of fact, there was a few years ago a case in London where people in a restaurant, they, were, they made a lima bean stew. And for reasons I'll explain in a second, uh, a lot of uh, customers that ate it got seriously ill. Nobody died, but it was a, a, a public health uh, scare. And uh, the reason why this is so is basically because beans are, or it happens when beans are not properly cooked. So beans, let me go back here. And this is going to be the end of this lecture. Beans are toxic uh, in raw state. If you cook them properly, they cease to be toxic. So uh, the recipe for eating beans of any type is cook them well. They need to be well cooked. It's a case in which even having a pressure cooker is even better than having a, a normal cooker. And slow cooking at low temperatures is not good for beans. Uh, it can provide a um, final result. The cooked result can be poisonous for you. Um, of course, more than poisonous to kill you, it will wreak havoc in your, in your uh, microbiome, in, your, in the microorganisms in your intestines. And that's why beans have this uh, fame that they can give you a bad fermentation. They can give you uh, flatulence. But cooked well, there are a few substances, a few natural products in the world that are more nutritious to human beings than beans. So next week, we're going to start to see the subfamilies in the bean family. Uh, but this is the end of uh, the Monday lecture. I hope to see you next uh, Wednesday. Thank you very much.